Pat, you can unmute too. Okay, before we get started, first of all, I wanna welcome everybody. Hope you're having a good evening. It's a beautiful day today, wasn't it? You know, and it's really neat. I'm, I'm glad because I was able to see everything today. It's fantastic. I had cataract surgery yesterday. I woke up this morning. I went in the bathroom, turned the light on, and I said, my wife put all new bulbs in last night. It was so bright. And the outside was, oh my God, I can't believe. It would have changed, I'm telling you. You're going to need sunglasses now. I do. i got to wear them now. It's unbelievable. But anyway, I want to make, give you a couple of announcements. Okay, uh, tomorrow at 3.30, one of our pr um, practitioners, Ann Cavalier, will be interviewing will be interviewed on understanding eating disorders. Anne is our uh, eating disorder therapist. We've been with Starting Point since 2004 and deals with all different types of eating disorders. So if you have the opportunity tomorrow at 3.30 and you want to stop in and it's, it, it's in a podcast, so they go questions back and forth and you put your questions in too. Next Tuesday at 7 p.m., as part of the monthly Tuesday series, Anne Marie and, and Court Ribnack will be talking about strength and vulnerability. You can get details about this on, on the website. Okay. And also, Anne Marie will be doing a podcast next week on isolation. So, all these things are available now because we do have a YouTube channel. And I mentioned this last week. If you get the opportunity to go to the YouTube channel and subscribe, you can help us out. It doesn't cost you anything. Just can I just add something here? The starting point just has a YouTube channel, but Vince has had a YouTube channel forever. So <laughs> starting point has a new YouTube channel. It's not my my mine has my name on it. Anyway, I think it does. I don't know. Forget about it. <laughs> I do want to mention that we're finishing the <clears throat> grief and loss series tonight. And then next week, we'll be starting the series on codependency. I do want to mention uh, one of the things that's really important is to remember that we do record these sessions, or we, even today, since we have a guest with me today. I'll tell you about her in a couple of minutes. And basically, uh, we record them, and they are on both Starting Point's uh, YouTube channel and also under Vince's Corner on my stuff, too. We put everything out there. Okay. I'm going to, be, oh, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble. We also pass, pass the basket normally, and uh, we do have a Venmo account. It's in the chat room. You can, you know, if you can share, share, uh, share something, please. Okay, I'm going to begin by doing a reading from the language of letting go, and it kind of fits right into what we're talking about tonight. A block, a block to joy and love can be unresolved sadness from the past. We denied that it hurt because we didn't want to feel the pain. Unfinished business doesn't go away. It keeps repeating itself until it finally gets our attention, until we feel it, deal with it, and heal. That's one lesson we are learning in recovery from codependency and adult children issues. Many of us didn't have the tools, support, or safety needed to acknowledge and accept pain in our past. It's okay, we're safe now. Slowly, carefully, we can begin to open ourselves up to our feelings. We can begin the process of feeling what we have denied for so long. Not to blame, not to shame, but to heal ourselves in preparation for a better life. It's okay to cry when we need to cry and feel the sadness many of us have stored within for so long. We can feel and release these feelings. Grief is a cleansing process. It's an acceptance process. It moves us from our past into today and a better future, a future free of sabotaging behaviors, a future that holds more opinions than our past. God, as I move through this day, help me be open to my feelings. Today, let me know I don't have to either force or repress the healing available to me in recovery. Help me trust that I am open and available. The healing will happen naturally and it will happen in a manageable way. Okay, I have the honor tonight to conclude our series. I've invited uh, Pat Oakes, who's our grief counselor at Starting Point. Pat's been with Starting Point since 2000, 
six, I think. Okay, that means she's getting closer to me anyway every, every day. But the concept is she's been with us for a long time. Pat's a very beautiful lady who has done a lot of tremendous work in the grief field. You know, and we'll tell you a lot about that as she shares with you tonight. So it's a beautiful conclusion to our grief and loss series. So Pat, you know, welcome home. I'm going to turn it over to you and I'm going to shut up. Joy, you Pat. Love you. Well, you got the timing off just a little bit. I was an intern in 1996. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I've been around longer than you think. I know. You might be trying to catch up to me. <laughs> Eventually. Okay. Uh, so uh, if I could only age as well, Vince, as well as you. Uh, so as Vince mentioned, I'm one of the grief counselors there at Starting Point. Um, I wasn't always a grief counselor. Uh, my first couple of years, I was a generalist, uh, anxiety, depression, couples counseling, that sort of thing. Uh, then I lost my infant son 18 years ago to preterm birth and an infection. Um, so it, it was at that time, I took a year off um, and then I came back and, and my passion became uh, being a grief counselor and specializing with parents who've lost children. Uh, so, you know, throughout my life, um, I've been through that dark winding, uh, grief tunnel several times. My mother died when I was 24 and Ricky died when I was, uh, 38. Uh, and then, uh, my father just passed away this past March. He and Kenny Rogers got out of town. They knew when to fold up right before COVID. I think my dad died just a couple of weeks after Kenny Rogers. Um, so I, you know, I've, I've been through this tunnel many times, uh, and I see my practice as I have the lantern, uh, and can help others find their way through their grief journey, um, from that darkness into that light. Now there's lots of different types of, of loss. Um, but today we're going to focus mainly on the loss of a loved one. So I want to try this little exercise with you. Um, now some of you have shoes on some of you don't because I understand we're all at home um, but uh, so there's this saying pull yourself up by your bootstraps right so if you all look at your feet I doubt that anybody has bootstraps anymore and maybe back in the old days but not anymore but even if you were to grab your shoes or grab your socks and you can try this as an experiment right now if you want and try to stand up and just try to walk now, don't hurt yourself please but it's impossible. So that whole idea of just, you know, buck up and pull yourself up by your bootstraps is kind of ridiculous when you really think about it. So what we're going to explore tonight is the, the title of this talk is The Grieving Brain, How to Heal. Something that a lot of people don't understand is really how, the, how grief affects the brain. And part of the reason for that is because it's fairly new, our knowledge about this. Um, it's only been over the last maybe 15 years or so, and as MRIs and things like that have come out, that we've been able to really explore this. Um, so for some of you, this may be, you might have known it generally. Yeah, of course, it affects my brain, but not really how. And I think when we understand a bit more, we're able to be more self-compassionate. We're able to be more compassionate towards others who are also in grief. Um, and we're not carrying around so much guilt because you know we're not able to just you know bounce back. Um, so we're going to explore why that that bootstrap strategy doesn't work. Dr. Janelle Phillips, who's a neuropsychologist at uh, the Henry Ford Health System, says that you know we've all heard of baby brains right? New moms, they're not getting any sleep, their hormones are all out of whack, they have baby brain, and we accept that that's a real thing. Then there's chemo brain. You know, some people on, probably every one of us knows somebody who's had cancer, has had chemo. Uh, I had breast cancer seven years ago and had a bilateral mastectomy. I was put on tamoxifen, which even though it's a pill, it is under the, the chemo class of drugs. Uh, for the first couple months, I double booked my clients about once a week because I had chemo brain. My brain just was not functioning. So we all accept that, but it's also important that we accept that there's such a thing as grief brain. And so I'm gonna describe what that really means. 
Uh, so we have to treat our brains like a phys physical, brains are part of our body. So if we think in terms of a physical injury, if you got hit by a truck and had broken bones, you would not expect to run a marathon a week later. And nobody else would either. But you literally get hit by a Mack truck in your brain when you undergo grief and especially traumatic or sudden loss. And so we need to have that same understanding that it's gonna take time, just like it would take time for our body, for our brain to heal. In our body, the bones, the muscles, the ligaments, the nerves, they all have to have time to come back together. So do all the connections and chemistries in our brain. Um, so our brain function, it just takes this hit where there's a flood of neurochemicals and hormones that, that throw it all out of whack. Dr. Richard Honecker, he's the chief officer of You Doctors Online. Uh, he talks about the changes in the brain, especially for serotonin and dopamine. Now, uh, some of you and many of my clients um, may be on psychotropic medications. And what they do is they help that serotonin uh, dopamine balance, okay? Because it's, it's off kilter. Uh, so that's a lot of times what's happening with you in, in grief. Uh, the brain wiring, just the circuitry, there's, there's what they call neurotransmitters and they're like wires and they all connect in our brain. Um, that gets turned upside down. So the prefrontal cortex, I'm not gonna get too scientific, I just wanna warn you. <laughs> um, the prefrontal cortex of our brain is it, the control center, controls decisions, rational thinking. What happens is that takes a backseat in our brain when we're in grief. And the limbic system, which is the survival instinct, that fight or flight, that takes over the driver's seat. So you see how your brain is actually flipped when you go through grief. So because of this, we don't absorb the world and our environment the way that we normally would. Yeah, when we're stressed, sure, we have all kinds of regular anxieties and things happening in our, in our life. You know, life's not always peaceful. Um, but generally our brain stays fairly balanced, but when we're in grief, it doesn't, it flips. Dr. Lisa Shulman, who's the professor of neurology at University of Maryland, uh, she goes into detail regarding what MRIs can show us now today. Um, these scans can show that grief actually stimulates and affects different parts and what different parts of the brain does it affect and how. The prefrontal cortex, that's the thinking center. What they see on the MRI is that that becomes underactive when we're in grief. The cingulate cortex, which is the emotional regulation, you know, just regulating your emotions like a thermostat, right? That becomes underactive in grief. The amygdala, which is part of that limbic system, that's the fear center, right? That becomes overactive. So that's why a lot of times we feel anxious or under threat when we're in grief. So these disruptions then in the brain, they cause confusion, disorientation, detachment, increased forgetfulness, okay? Because the brain is so busy now managing stress, okay? And then the way that that manifests itself, as I'm sure you've all experienced some of these um, as you've you know, experience different losses in your life. Insomnia, okay? Several of my clients take sleep aids and it's, it, they might not have ever had sleep issues before, um, but they need them because their brain chemistry is all off. Hypervigilance. Um, I don't know if any of you ever have ever seen the commercial. I think it's an, an insurance commercial, but um, there's a mother kind of shooing her kids off on a bike ride and she's got them all in bubble wrap. They're all like, the Michelin man, they're all bubble wrapped um, because she's trying to protect them. And, you know, don't we all kind of feel that way when we've had the loss of a loved one? We feel like we want to bubble wrap everybody and protect everybody. So that's that hypervigilance. The anxiety, the distressing dreams, disturbed sleep, um, loss of appetite is also a common thing. 
Uh, a lot of people drop a lot of weight early on uh, because our, again, with the hormones and the, the chemistry, they don't feel hungry. So I often um, encourage my clients that if you don't feel hungry, drink. And I don't mean alcohol, but drink nutritious, like boost, ensure, even a milkshake, um, because you're going to get some nutrients at least. If you, and, and a lot of times it's easier for people to drink something like that rather than eat. Uh, you know, during, a, especially right after a loss. Um, fatigue, people, again, because you're managing stress 24 seven when you're in grief, you get what I call the grief flu. So on a, when you're feeling well, when things are going fine, you watch TV, you get up during the commercial, get something to drink, you come back to the couch, you sit down, you finish watching your show. But when you have grief, you have the grief flu. So basically what that means is like when you have the regular flu, you're laying on the couch, you get up, you shuffle off to the kitchen, you get something to drink, you shuffle back and then you collapse on the couch and you sleep for three hours. Why? Because your body is so busy trying to heal, heal itself from the flu. Well, your brain is doing the same thing. It's trying to heal and it's, it gets very fatigued just like your body does when you have the flu. Irritability is another manifestation. Um, a lot of times I tell my clients that probably means you need a good cry or you need to go, uh, you know, uh, uh, to hit a punching bag or go out into the woods and throw sticks and rocks because you got to get the anger out. Uh, you either got to get the tears out or the anger out um, because you're biting everybody's head off. <laughs> And your family will be grateful for you for going and having a good cry. Uh, so that irritability is another manifestation. Of course, sadness, difficulty in concentrating. You know, I suggest to, to clients, especially early on, um, break things down into smaller bites. And especially if people have to continue working, even though they're grieving, um, where you used to be able to concentrate on something for an hour or two, it might be in 20 minute increments. So you have to, to break that down into smaller pieces. Of course, there's anger, there's disorientation um, because of the rapid change in your circumstances. I've had people tell me, you know, they, they drive to work and they don't even remember that time <laughs> or what they passed by when they were driving or anything like that. Cause there's this disorientation in place and time sometimes. Headaches, get sick easier. So these are all the ways that we manifest because all that brain chemistry is off, okay? Another phenomenon that happens is triggers. And I'm sure all of you who've experienced grief know what I mean when I say triggers, right? They activate the fight or flight response because remember the amygdala is on overdrive. So you're gonna be overly sensitive to things. And so, you know, you're not going crazy if you cry in the middle of the store because you got triggered. That's your grief because, because you're raw, okay? So smells, um, I don't know if any of you saw Joe Biden's, um, President Biden's uh, uh, vigil for the 500,000 uh, lost to COVID. And he talked about um, how, you know, the, he was very empathetic about the kind of grief that I think he, uh, the phrase he used is, you know, the, the smell, when you open the closet and you smell your loved one's scent, you know, because everybody, you know, you, you, you know that that was the way they smelled their cologne or, or whatever. Um, sights, uh, like, you know, what we see, like pictures. Some people can look at pictures right away. Some people can't. Some people, even when they can look at them right away, after a while, they can't for, for a couple months. And it goes back and forth sometimes with things like pictures, what they can see, what they can't. Um, music, a lot of people stop listening to music uh, for a while or certain, certain types of music or certain songs because music comes through that emotional side of the brain. And you know that's on fire, right? <laughs> that's all lit up. So we're, we're gonna cry more, um, which we can use. You know, when we get stopped up, we can use music to help us release and have that good cry. Uh, and that's okay. Um, places, you know, times I've had people say, you know, I have to pass by 
this restaurant that we used to go to, you know, that I used to go to with my husband and I get upset. That's a trigger. Um, and, and, and seeing certain people, uh, I had a grandmother who lost her um, three-year-old granddaughter. And for a long time, whenever she would go into a store, if she would catch a glimpse of like a three-year-old little blonde haired girl, she would get triggered. Uh, all perfectly natural. You're not going crazy. And, and those things, it's because we're so sensitive and raw. So how do we heal with our brain all a mess? Um, first of all, it is a protective mechanism to help us to survive in the face of this emotional trauma. So just like when we're injured, like I don't know if any of you have had like a broken bone, for instance, what, what goes on it? A cast. Why? To hold it still, but also to protect it from the outside world. So we're kind of isolating that area of our body, putting a barrier between that area of our body and the outside world. And in, in, in order to heal that broken bone. So in order to heal our brain, we do need to insulate to some degree. We do need some boundaries. We do need uh, some level of isolation. Um, too much isolation is not a good, thing, not a healthy thing, um, but we do need that alone time and uh, time to grieve. So our goal in healing is to restore those neural pathways in our brain that are all amped up. And we've got to reverse that chronic stress that it's under. So here are some ways that you do that. One way is called immersion distraction. Not avoidance, this is different from avoidance, which is not healthy, but immersion and distraction. So immersion, it can be difficult because we're deliberately exposing ourselves to difficult memories and emotions. We're telling the stories over and over again. Maybe we're going to support groups, talking with our counselor, we're journaling. Um, uh, after, after the loss of Ricky, I took a year off um, and I just fully immersed myself in the grieving process. Listening to the songs, journaling, writing poetry, all those kinds of things. Uh, because when we do that, it allows our psyche to begin to be able to tolerate the loss, okay? Uh, the other part is distraction. And distraction is, um, it's the gradual re-engagement in meaning and fulfilling activities and, and purpose in our lives uh, that you know, kind of takes us away from that pain for a little while. Um, I have some parents who's, uh, adult children uh, have died from the, the disease of addiction and they have their child's child, uh, their grandchild that they're taking care of. Um, and that's part of their distraction. On one, one hand, it um, helps them feel close to their child that they lost because it's a part of them. On the other hand, it's also part of that distraction where they can have some purpose. So that's important too. Uh, also embracing and accepting. We have to embrace and accept the changes that are happening in the brain. So hopefully now, uh, you know, all of you understanding the brain a little bit more, um, you can be more accepting of that in yourselves. Because sometimes we put ourselves down, we beat ourselves up. And as I tell my clients, you know, you've got enough to deal with. Don't also put on top of it guilt and shame. You're already trudging up a mountain with, you know, 10 bags of rocks in each hand. Don't add another five rocks in each hand by, by adding in shame and, and beating yourself up. Um, so, you know, when we can understand what's happening with us, we're a little bit more, like I said, self-compassionate. Um, so the, um, the embracing and accepting where we're, we're taking some time, we're spending that time with our grief, like I said, it has to be sometimes in alone time, people are gonna tell you, oh, go out, do things, be with other people. That's what's gonna help you. And sometimes that's not the best thing. So I encourage people, drive yourself if you're going somewhere so that you can leave early or drive with someone who's willing to um, leave early with you. That way you won't get 
stuck? Think about it. If you had a physical surgery of double knee replacement and you're, you know, would you go out with your friends the next week dancing? No. Okay. You said you would say oh, in a couple months when I've done some rehab, right? Uh, same thing with your brain. Okay. So you want it, you, you want to protect that. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Brene Brown, but she has, I, I just saw this uh, the other night when I was preparing this. Um, a, a wonderful thing, a wonderful quote that says, grief requires witnessing, meaning we have to witness it for ourselves before we can expect anybody else to honor it, okay? We have to honor it within ourselves. So she says here, each person's grief is as unique as their fingerprint, but what everyone has in common is that no matter how they grieve, they share a need for their grief to be witnessed. That doesn't mean needing someone to try to lessen it or reframe it for them. The need is for someone to be fully present to the magnitude of their loss without trying to point out the silver lining. And that's where that accepting and embracing, not trying to fix it, not trying to get over it. Uh, I, another way is through recovery and rehabilitation, right? Just like with our body, we need to recover and rehabilitate. Um, uh, and, and begin to integrate because if we don't integrate both hemispheres of our brain, what happens is we, we get lopsided. We get too much of the feeling side of the brain. Um, and people get stuck in what I call victim mode. Blame of self, blame of others, woulda, coulda, shoulda, this is so awful. And they just get stuck there and there's not enough rational thinking or people go the other way where there's too much rational thinking they're the pull yourself up by your bootstraps um where they silence their feelings and their rational thought takes over so much that they bury everything and they stuff it so what we want to do and unfortunately what happens is grief finds a way it's like water right it'll find a way and what happens is people who stuff it then they maybe start drinking, they start cheating, uh, they get sick, okay? So it, that's why it's important for us to um, you know, do some of the things that I'm talking about and allow both hemispheres of the brain to get in balance again. Um, also encouraging um, integration through um, therapy where we can sort things out where we can find some resolution, where we can express our sadness um, using mindfulness. There was a study in 2019 in um, Frontiers in Human Neuroscience, and they found that after eight weeks of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, that people improve their memory, um, their organizing thoughts, and other executive functioning of their brain. These are all people who were, were in grief. And they were able to start having that balance come back. Uh, breath work and meditation. Um, with breathing, there's, we have what's called the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic is that fight or flight. Parasympathetic is chill out, calm down. When we're anxious and we're in threat mode, we breathe with the top of our lungs. We don't breathe deep. The parasympathetic nervous system, the chill out part, gets turned on by the vagus nerve, which goes down to our diaphragm. So if we don't breathe deep, we're never turning on that calming part of our brain. And so, you know, breath work is also important, the, the, the breathing deep. Um, and that's something that, you know, therapists can help people to do. I use that a lot in, in my practice. So there's a thing called neuroplasticity. And that's what gives us hope here is that the brain is not completely hardwired. There's a malleability to it. And that's neuroplasticity that the brain wiring, just like it can change from normal to flipped on its head in grief, it can also flip back. Okay. Because there's that level of flexibility in the brain. Uh, and part of how we do that is with restorative experiences. 
our loved ones are dead, but they're not gone. Literally in our brain, those neurosynaptic connections, there are clusters in our brain of the people we love. It's like a file drawer for the people we love. That never goes away. When we have relationships, there's a tangible relationship, right? You can touch, feel, hear, see the person you love. And there's an intangible relationship. You love them. They have a personality. You can think about them, but you can't touch any of those things, right? When they die, the tangible goes away. The intangible does not. So how do we connect with that intangible? And that's where those re restorative experiences come in. So we start to connect. We connect with things like keepsakes. You know, I have a lot of people who, you know, they take the, the, the t-shirts of their loved one and they, they make, have the bears made from them. Uh, they get quilts and blankets made from them that they can wrap themselves in. Uh, I have my mother's rocking chair. My father bought my mom this beautiful wooden rocking chair um, to rock her first grandchild in. And so after Ricky died, I sat in that and I felt like it was a hug from my mother. Uh, now, some of these things are bitter at first, like there's a lot of pain when we connect with them. And then they become bittersweet where there's kind of pain and comfort. And then eventually they're very comforting. Um, there's also new connections that we can, we can create, uh, not just from the things we had of that person's. Uh, I have a client who lost her son to the disease of addiction and um, cardinals were associated with him. And she, she didn't want to put up a regular Christmas tree. So she found online ornaments that were cardinals. And she thought, you know what? I'm going to, she got like a tabletop Christmas tree and she put these, these beautiful red cardinal um, ornaments for all the people in her life that she had, she's I think almost 70. So a decent amount of people in her life that she has lost and, and each one represented someone that she lost. And after Christmas, she kept the one that was representative of her son and it's up next to his urn. Um, so that's, that was a new thing. Uh, I had a client who, um, instead of a green tree, she bought a white Christmas tree. And she, she went in her basement and got the box of the ornaments that her son um, had and had and made when he was a kid. I think it was a Flyers fan, so there was a Flyers ornament, things like that. She bought the white tree so you would really be able to see them. And she, she put his ornaments all over that tree and, and it just, it comforted her. Sure, she cried as she was doing it. That's the bitter part, right? But then the sweet part was that she could see it every day. Um, so there's, there's these new connections that we can make, but there's also new memories, meaning that our memories don't, our memories of life with that person don't stop when they die. We can create new memories. On Ricky's first birthday, we went to the cemetery and we put balloons up and we released butterflies. I have pictures from that day. I have pictures of my younger son <laughs> chasing the butterfly. Um, so that goes in Ricky's album. That event happened after he died, but yet it's part of his story continuing. I have a client who, um, her son was cremated and she's, she's got a small urn with his ashes, but also his ashes have been given to family members in you know, how you can get those necklaces and things made. Um, but she went skiing not too long ago and he loved the mountains and loved the snow, loved to ski. She took um, some of his ashes and buried them in the snow. And so now that's a new memory post. You see, after he died, she's created a new memory. Um, so that's a, another part of the restorative experiences. So the integration of this loss gives us purpose and meaning again. Um, some people decide to let, let me connect to something that my child uh, was passionate about. I have a friend whose son was passionate about um, uh, Greenpeace. And so she joined and gives money to them and 
you know, for the environment and all that kind of thing. Uh, so I did March of Dimes. March of Dimes was launching a, um, a prematurity campaign and that's how Ricky died. So I became a speaker for that. I have a client who her daughter um, loved animals. And this mother was, she's, she's been kind of lost for a while. And what she started to do, because often parents need to nurture, okay? And that doesn't go away, nurturing their child just because they die. And so how could she continue that nurturance? Um, so she has signed on with a rescue and she now fosters cats and dogs she she gets them acclimated and trained so that then they can be adopted out and there's such a difference in her she's got life in her eyes again because it's connected with her daughter but it's also it's something meaningful and and purposeful for her so that's how we can heal but then how can we move even further than that um how can we actually thrive Okay. So often people tell me, they say they feel like they've lost themselves. Now, when we have losses, we will never be the same again. Um, we've changed. To, you know, things in us have shifted, which is not necessarily a bad thing uh, if we embrace it. So there's going to be new things that we develop about ourselves, and there's going to be some of the old it feels like we lost it, but it's just buried. And I think all of us have seen those pictures of like the flower busting out from under the concrete, right? My clients are those flowers, a lot of them. And that's what gives me inspiration. Just thinking about, about them. People say, how do you do what you do? I do it because I get to see them heal and then flourish. Um, so, Dr. Robert Niemeyer, he talks about this. He talks about it, um, about, in his words, ultimately grieving isn't just about loss. It's potentially about gain as we reinvent ourselves and grow. Like I said, I was, the, you know, a generic, lack of better term, therapist when I started. Um, but now I have a thriving practice where I've, Ricky, I think, has helped thousands of people at this point. Ricky lived for 32 and a half hours, and he has helped thousands of people. That's thriving. Um, a client of mine who lost her only child, her daughter, to uh, a, a tragic murder, um, the first year or so of her life, she didn't even want to live. But after working together for several years, um, she was able to thrive. She had been extremely overweight. She had struggled with depression her whole life. She knew that her daughter wanted her to be happy and she wanted her to be healthy. And that's what we connected with. She lost the weight and her goal was to fit into her daughter's clothing. She came into my office one day and she was wearing her daughter's clothes. And we just hugged because she felt so connected with her at that point. Um, and then she made other changes in her life. She got out of a relationship that was not healthy for her. Um, she retired. She found a wonderful, wonderful man uh, who they, they retired together, moved to the Midwest, lives on a lake. She now has grandchildren through him, through his uh, previous marriage, you know, his children, their grandchildren. She thought she'd never have grandchildren because her only child died. And, and here she's thriving. I have a picture of her where she's on the boat on the lake and the, you know, the wind is blowing in her hair and she's got this big grin on her face. Now, I also just got a, a Facebook post from her yesterday. It was her daughter's birthday. She grieves this time every year because this is when her daughter went missing and then was found murdered. So that never goes away, but she's able to thrive even though her daughter is dead because her daughter is not gone. 
and she tapped into what her daughter wanted for her and she is happy and she is thriving. So that's what we call PTG, post-traumatic growth, where if we take care of ourselves, we surround ourselves with supportive people, if we look for these opportunities for connection with our loved ones, if we process through our grief in all the ways that I described here, we can help ourselves and help our brain get back into that emotional equilibrium. And that creates the fertile soil then for us not only to heal, but to thrive. Post-traumatic growth where people experience positive psychological, social, and spiritual changes. Um, I've had people who, after their loss, not only have they healed from that, healed through, not from, but through that particular loss, they've taken the time to go through a lot of their maybe dysfunctional childhood stuff, and they've come out better than before the loss because they've allowed that opportunity of being completely broken to say, you know what? I am going to clean house completely. And now they're thriving. I have a woman who, after the, the, the loss of her, um, her mother and her sister, we, we did a lot of that inner child work. Thanks to you, Vince, who taught me how to do that. Um, and uh, she has such a fantastic relationship now with her husband that, you know, it was strained uh, for, for a while there that she didn't have before these losses because she took the time to do that. So, um, you know, we've, we've lost a treasure, not a trinket when we have a loss and we need to honor that. The healing comes from time. The thriving and the post-traumatic growth comes from insight. And that's why it's important to continue to, you know, listen to these lectures, uh, to, to read, to listen to podcasts. I have, I have clients who listen to podcasts to, um, you know, to help themselves deal with the anxiety and that kind of thing and, and, and old stuff as well as their grief. Um, and, and that allows them to grow beyond the loss. If we allow ourselves to grieve, if we give ourselves time to heal, and if we believe that we can thrive again, then we can find purpose and meaning in our lives. I want us to, to um, give you a visual that kind of sums all that up. Uh, when I, I did a program called the Afterwards Program, and it was for people who are one to five years out from a, from a loss. And uh, one of the, the uh, activities we had people do was we had threads that were about six inches long, the, um, the kind of threads that you use in embroidery. And there were seven colors. One was black, one was brown, one was gold, and the others were blue, green, red, and purple. And um, we had it tied at one end and then we paired people up and they braided it. Um, and then they could use it for a bookmark, a bracelet, whatever they wanted to afterwards. But the, the, the black, um, that represented their losses. The brown represented, you know, all the um, uh, limiting beliefs that they had about their, their loss or whether or not they'd ever get better and, and those sorts of things. And then the gold represented resilience. And the other colors just represented, you know, different parts of life. So when they braided it, what they noticed is that you didn't get rid of the black thread. The losses were still there, but it was kind of all commingled. And what stood out was the gold thread, the resilience. And that's the post-traumatic growth. That's the what can come through and are without running from our losses, um, putting our losses in a corner, when we integrate it in our lives, um, we're, able to, we're able to not only heal, but to thrive. And I wanna close with a poem um, that, I, that I thought sort of uh, 
sums all this up. I get grief quotes all the time because I'm a grief counselor. So <laughs> they come up on my feed all the time. And I thought, and I actually, this one came up when I was writing this two nights ago. This is by Gwen Flowers called Grief. I had my own notion of grief. I thought it was a sad time that followed the death of someone you love and you had to push through it to get to the other side. But I'm learning there is no other side. There's no pushing through, but rather there is absorption, adjustment, and acceptance. And grief is not something that you complete, but rather you endure. Grief is not a task to finish and move on, but an element of yourself, an alteration of your being, a new way of seeing, a new definition of self. And that's all I have. Vince, back to you. Before we <clears throat> close out tonight, I just want to, first of all, thank Pat for all that wonderful, fantastic presentation because she's a very special and beautiful lady. And I also want to take a few minutes if we can <clears throat> just to have a couple moments of silence for all the people in our lives that we have lost and especially for all those you know, lost from this disease we've been dealing with. And I want to kind of conclude what Pat did with, with, with a little prayer. God, we come before you on our journey in life. We thank you for each and every person that's touched our lives. We thank you, especially for those who have moved on, knowing that they're still part of our journey. Thank you, God, for all the angels and all the people you have sent into our life as messengers. We're grateful for every one of them. As we reflect back on our own lives to all those people who've touched us and we've touched them, for the losses we've gone through physically, teach us to know that spiritually, they are part of our journey. They are part of our teaching. They are part of who we are. God, you are very special and beautiful as you help us through these moments in life these moments of grief, these moments of growth, these moments that help us to sort through the things we have to sort through. Knowing that one day we'll all be connected back to you and knowing that those memories and things that are part of us will always be part of who we are. We pray especially as we look upon those who have gone before us, those teachers, those people that are part of our journey, our family, all those special, beautiful people that are part of our life. We say thank you. Thank you for the gift you've given to us by sharing your life with us. We pray for those who died in tragedy, those who died suddenly, for we know that deep down inside, they too are still part of us and part of who we are. And so we ask you to bless and guide all those who have gone before us, bless and guide us as we continue the journey on this earth and teach us to constantly not be afraid to ask for your help and your guidance as we go through this beautiful process of life. We pray and we ask for your guidance every day. We pray for it in gratitude. We pray for it in humility and love. We pray for it in your name, amen. And now I'm gonna ask all of you to mind unmuting and we'll close by saying the we version of the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. God's will, not mine, be done. <laughs>